Record. Okay. So it's uh, 1.30, time to get rolling. So um, the quiz on that particular chapter will be on Thursday. And so, you know, it's, I, most of those quizzes, it'll be between five or between 10 and 15, true, false, just about all of them are true, false. It might be a multiple choice. And I mean, I'm not trying to make it hard, but if you read that chapter, you realize it's incredible how much information B and W packs in one of those chapters. And I, I'm not wanting to persecute you, but on the other hand, I'm wanting you to just gain some kind of knowledge and realize, you know, some of the technologies that are out there for particulate control. So, you know, do your best. Typical grades on the quizzes are probably 50 to 75%. If you're getting 50 to 75%, you're doing just as good as anybody else. Ever once in a blue moon, somebody will make 90 to 100. But most of the time, you know, because there's just too much information. Now, doing this on iLearn, I don't know, you know, but you're only going to have like 10 minutes. So you could, you could maybe research a few of them, but, you know, probably not all of them. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, you'll, you'll have to be able to log into iLearn because, I, I mean, nobody's coming. So, I mean, we, you know, so the quiz will be on iLearn. If you guys, if you guys that want to come to class, you can, you can bring your computer and take it here if you want to. It'd be fine with me, you know, or, but, you know, if you want to take it at home, that's fine. I'll, I'll talk to the construction guys over there. <laughs> but it'll only be about 10 minutes. So, and then we'll get on to, to the class. Okay, so um, in the investigation of turbines, I thought about this the other day, and there's this fellow out here. Is this thing gonna play? I don't know, I probably won't play in here now. There it is. Uh, so anyway, there's a series and this one fellow narrates these things and they're really quite good. And so we're gonna start watching some. I'll send you the links and uh, cause we probably won't watch all of it in class, but I, I, I think it's good to watch some of it. That way we can, you know, I, I get it on the recording as well. And so I make sure that you all see some of it. And uh, it also breaks up the, uh, the monotony of the uh, lecture a little bit. So um, I'd say we'll probably watch, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes of this and get in and then you can note where we have left off if you wanna go watch it or we might watch a little bit more of it uh, another day. But uh, anyway, this would uh, be interesting to get your reaction to this too after you've watched a little bit. steam production and the different types of boilers and fossil fuels which are used for this purpose. We are now going to shift the focus onto steam utilization by taking a detailed look at the steam turbine which drives the electrical generator. We already studied the various turbine cycles and factors affecting efficiency at the beginning of this program. In this module, we'll look at the main features of turbine construction including the various components and support systems, such as land steam, lube and hydraulic oil, and the condenser. The subject of turbine operation, control, and protection will be dealt with in the next module. The steam turbine is certainly one of the most popular prime movements, especially for driving large power generators. The size of steam turbines built and installed runs all the way from about 5 megawatts up to 1,000 megawatts or more. So what is it that makes the steam turbine the preferred prime mover in comparison with, say, the diesel engine? Well, there are quite a number of advantages, the main factor being that of physical size. 
For example, a 30 megawatt steam turbine is probably smaller than a 5 megawatt diesel. Another advantage is that the steam turbine is far less complicated and contains very few moving parts. The moving parts are the rotor, which drives the generator, and the steam control valve and control gear. The amount of vibration produced by a steam turbine generator and transmitted to the surrounding area is relatively low, provided, of course, that the machine is in good condition and is correctly installed and aligned. This makes for a quieter operating plant, particularly when compared with the diesel engine or even the gas turbine. The steam turbine runs at high speed, usually 3,600 RPM in North America or 3,000 RPM in Europe, and can therefore be coupled directly to a two-pole generator. Remembering that the diesel engine operates at around 200 RPM, we can see one of the reasons why the specific output of the steam turbine is much greater. One other advantageous factor is the relative ease of controlling the output of the steam turbine. This is achieved simply by adjusting the amount of steam admitted to and flowing through the turbine. As we'll see later, admission valves, also known as control valves, are installed for this purpose. The turbine stop valve or valves is located upstream of the control valves. In case of an emergency, the stop valve closes automatically, cutting off all steam supply to the turbine and bringing the machine to a halt. This sketch shows us the major components of a 150 megawatt reheat turbine. We see here the rotor and the inner and outer casing or shell. This casing surrounds the rotor, leaving very fine clearances between the stationary and the moving parts. The objective of the inner casing is to direct the steam through the turbine. The inner casing is fitted into the upper and lower half of the outer shell, which in turn is supported on a heavy reinforced concrete base. The base must be firm enough to ensure rigidity. That is, it must permit no movement in the vertical plane, which could upset the alignment of the machine. The support bearings are allowed restricted movement in the axial plane to cope with expansion of the turbine as we shall see later. Other components noticeable here are the governor pedestal, which supports the front end bearing, and the governor system. In this particular machine, steam from the stop valve is fed into steam chests located on either side of the turbine. The turbine admission valves are located in each steam chest to control the flow of steam into the turbine. The turbine rotor is directly coupled to the generator rotor to transfer the mechanical energy produced in the turbine to the generator where it is converted into electrical energy. Now, as we progress through this module, we'll be discussing the function of all of these components and many others. At this point, we're mainly concerned with identifying these items. Make sure that you know where the following components are located on your particular turbines. The turbine outer casing, the generator, the turbine rotor, the generator rotor, and the associated coupling. The governor pedestal, the main steam stop valves, the steam chest and associated admission valves or control valves. The location of bearings which support the turbine rotor. Now, the particular machine that we've been studying is made up of several cylinders, and we'll be looking at other cylinder arrangements in a moment. But first, let's take a closer look at a single cylinder machine in order to help us understand the principles of turbine operation, how it actually functions and produces power. As we all know, steam at high pressure and temperature, say 1800 PSIA and 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, is admitted at one end of the turbine. After passing through the turbine, this steam exits at a much lower pressure and temperature, say 50 PSIA and 250 degrees Fahrenheit, 
for a typical back pressure turbine. However, if the turbine is of the condensing type, and this is far more common, then the steam exiting from the turbine will be at a pressure far below atmospheric, say 1 PSIA, and at a temperature of about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Clearly, the amount of energy in the steam exhausted from the turbine is much less than in the steam entering the turbine. The heat energy has been used to force the turbine rotor to rotate at high speed and consequently produce mechanical energy. But how does it do this? Well, the simple answer is that the turbine blades are designed to take advantage of the decrease in steam pressure and consequent increase in steam velocity. As we know, the heart of the turbine, the bit that makes it work, is the relationship between the fixed and moving blades. The fixed blades guide the steam onto the moving blades. As the steam passes through the moving blades, it causes the disc to which they are attached to rotate, and consequently the shaft rotates. Each pair of stationary and associated moving blades are known as one stage. Most steam turbines contain many stages of blading. In this example of a single cylinder machine shown here, we have seven stages. And do not forget the stationary blade is always ahead of the moving blade. Actually, each pair of stationary blades is shaped to form a convergent divergent nozzle. However, the form of the nozzle is bent to receive the steam exiting from the previous moving stage and then to turn and redirect the steam onto the next moving stage. Now, before you raise the question, but what about impulse and reaction type blading? Let me say that in practice, when you're operating a turbine, it's not vitally important whether the blading is impulse or reaction. This is really a design and construction feature. However, it will certainly be worth our while to take a look at this subject as the type of blading used does affect other structural features. Let's first examine impulse blading. As the steam passes through the first row of stationary blades or nozzles, its pressure decreases, and as a result, the steam velocity increases. These changes are plotted on this graph. As this high velocity steam is directed onto the moving blade, the impulse pushes the blade forward and consequently produces rotation of the shaft. By the time the steam leaves the moving blade, it has lost much of its velocity, and it then passes on through the next row of stationary blades. Again, the pressure falls and the velocity increases due to expansion of the steam. And once again, this is directed onto the next row of moving blades and so on. We can see that as a result of pressure drop, the velocity of the steam increases each time it passes through a set of stationary blades, but the velocity then decreases as the steam passes through the moving blades and gives up energy. Eventually, when the pressure has fallen to a low value, it can no longer expand and produce work, and it is exhausted from the turbine. But look what happens here to the pressure as the steam passes through the moving blades. It does not decrease, neither does it increase. In fact, the pressure across the moving blades remains the same. It is the change in velocity which actually does the work and provides the energy to drive the turbine. This feature of impulse blading, that is constant pressure across the moving stage, brings about a certain constructional advantage. As there is no pressure drop, there is no tendency for steam to leak around the outside circumference of the blades. Because of this feature, we will inevitably find that impulse blading is used in the high pressure stages of the turbine. In fact, you'll often see large holes bored through the wheel or disc in the higher pressure stages. This is done to ensure that there is no pressure differential across the wheel and so maintain the correct impulse characteristic of the moving blades. Now let's move on to look at the characteristics of reaction type blading. In this case, the mechanical force on the blade is caused by reaction 
as the jet of steam exits from the blade. This is the same concept as a jet engine. With this type of blading, the moving blades are shaped in the same manner as the fixed blade, that is in the profile of a curved nozzle. This causes the steam pressure to fall as it passes through the moving blade, resulting in an expansion of the steam and an increase in its velocity relative to the blade, causing a powerful jet action. As before, the exiting steam then passes into the next stage of fixed blades, where it is again expanded and redirected to enter the next set of moving blades. So you can see that in this type of blading, the pressure decreases as the steam passes through both the moving blades and the stationary blading. Although the reaction turbine is efficient in its use of heat, there is always the potential for some losses due to steam leaking around the periphery of the moving blades, especially in the high pressure section. In order to reduce this tendency, a reaction turbine will normally have many more stages so that the pressure drop in each stage is lower. Consequently, the machine will be physically longer. In practice, a compromise is reached, and today most turbines combine both types, using impulse blading in the high pressure stages and reaction blading in the low pressure stages. Now, at this point, it's time we all took a break, and then we'll come back and look more closely at features of turbine construction. For now, please switch off the tape and review this material in your workbook. Okay, can you guys out there hear this fairly well? I can hear it fairly well. Okay, I've got I've got all the volumes I I have maxed. I think so. If it, if this is not acceptable at all, uh, let me know and we won't do any more of it. But uh, this guy is pretty good. I think uh, as long as you guys can hear acceptably, we'll do about another ten minutes. Yeah. Well, it's it, it's it's both velocity and uh, pressure drop because because of the way it's configured that that impulse blade it just kind of it just kind of swings the velocity vector around and changes the direction. And so it's the change in direction that causes it. But the other one, I mean, that, that, that steam is, is attacking that airfoil blade. And when you go around an airfoil blade, it's like lift on an airplane. You know, the, the path across the top is longer. And so it, it has to move faster. And so you get a, a pressure drop on the top side versus the bottom side where it's relatively flat. And so then you get a delta P that pushes it as well as the change in velocity. So you get kind of two, uh, there's two aspects to the reaction blading where you just have the velocity vector change on the impulse blading. I'm sure we all remember the old trick question, what weighs more, one ton of feathers or one ton of lead? Well, of course, both of these quantities weigh the same. We have just said so, one ton. But there is no doubt that the volume of feathers would be much, much greater than that of lead. In other words, the specific volume of feathers in cubic meters per kilogram or cubic feet per pound is much greater than that of lead. This problem of specific volume is of concern to us when we consider the steam passing through the turbine. We know that the steam pressure falls and consequently its volume must increase as it approaches the low pressure end. In fact, the change in specific volume of steam is quite dramatic as we can see in this table. One pound of steam at 2,500 PSIA and 1,050 degrees Fahrenheit occupies a space of one third of a cubic foot. At 500 PSIA and 500 degrees Fahrenheit, the specific volume is one cubic foot. 
At atmospheric conditions, the volume occupied by one pound of steam is 27 cubic feet. And in the case of a condensing turbine where we have steam exhausting at say one PSIA, the specific volume is 333 cubic feet per pound. So one clear consequence of this is that we have to make the casing continuously bigger as we move from the high pressure to the low pressure end. This is very evident to the eye when we look at this single cylinder turbine. But notice, it is not only the casing that must be made bigger, but the turbine blades must also be larger in order to utilize this low pressure steam. On turbines of high output, say above 100 megawatts, it becomes physically difficult to make the cylinder large enough to accommodate all of the low pressure steam. To get over this problem, multi-cylinder arrangements are used, and let's look at some of these arrangements. Here we see a common arrangement of two cylinders which may be used for units of up to about 150 megawatts. Crossover pipes are used to connect the exhaust from the high pressure cylinder to the inlet of the low pressure cylinder. Most low pressure cylinders are of the double flow type where steam enters at the center and flows outwards in opposite directions. This provides some balance to the thrust and tends to keep the shaft centered. As the steam path of the high pressure and low pressure cylinders is in series, all of the control is carried out of the steam inlet admission valves at the high pressure end. The next development from this two cylinder arrangement introduces reheat and the addition of the intermediate pressure stage of the turbine. A very common arrangement for reheat turbines up to about 250 megawatts is shown here. The high pressure and intermediate pressure cylinders are combined in one casing. But of course, the steam path is quite separate. Note that the concept of counterflow is also used here with the steam flowing through the high pressure cylinder in the opposite direction to that of the intermediate pressure cylinder to help produce a balanced thrust. As turbines become bigger and bigger, it is necessary to add yet further cylinders and the arrangement shown here is typical for machines in the 500 to 600 megawatt range. As you can see, we have separate high pressure and intermediate pressure cylinders. And also it has become necessary to add a further low pressure cylinder in order to handle the high volume of steam. With all of the configurations shown, the general control of steam flow through the turbine is achieved by adjusting the admission valves at the high pressure inlet. However, note that with reheat units, additional control valves known as intercept valves are fitted at the inlet to the intermediate pressure cylinder for protection purposes. We'll be discussing this in detail when we look at control and protection in the next module in this series. Yet another cylinder arrangement used on earlier reheat machines is known as the cross compound system shown here. It really consists of two separate turbines, each coupled to their own generator, but interlocked through a common steam system. The high pressure and intermediate pressure cylinders drive one generator, while the two low pressure cylinders drive the other. Again, the steam flow through the combined turbine is controlled at the high pressure inlet, thus controlling the output of both generators. Of course, the large reheat units that we have been considering would typically be found in central power stations of large utility companies. More recent installations, particularly in industrial situations, are likely to be smaller units, probably within the range of 60 to 150 megawatts. In order to examine some of the basic construction features, let's take a look at this single cylinder machine. Steam is supplied to the steam chest from the boiler after passing through the turbine stop valve. The amount of steam passing through the turbine is regulated by adjustment of steam admission valves. This in turn controls the output of the turbine and the coupled generator. At various stages along the steam path, steam is extracted from the turbine. This extraction steam is commonly used for feed water heating 
but there may be other applications as well. The concept is that the extracted steam is put to good use after performing some work in the turbine. You will remember that we discussed this in the first tape in this series when we looked at efficiency. The turbine rotor is supported on journal bearings, which are located at each end of the cylinder. It is essential that these bearings retain their correct alignment, as the clearances between the rotating parts and the fixed parts of the machine are extremely small. A thrust bearing is located along with the journal bearing at the governor pedestal in order to locate the shaft and prevent movement in the axial direction. What do we mean by this? Well, in this single cylinder arrangement, the flow of steam through the turbine tends to push the rotor towards the generator. If this thrust was not contained, the rotating blades could conceivably come into contact with the stationary blades of the next stage and cause quite a catastrophe. To prevent this occurrence, a fixed collar on the shaft is held in position by lubricated thrust pads. During construction and maintenance of the machine, these pads are carefully set to ensure that the correct clearances exist between rotating and stationary parts. Allowance must be made for the casing to expand as it becomes heated by the steam flow. In a single cylinder machine like this, the normal method is to anchor the machine solidly at the low pressure end, that is at the turbine exhaust, and allow the front end pedestal to move forwards. In large machines, the expansion in this longitudinal direction may be over one inch, that is 25 millimeters. In this particular machine, the pedestal is fixed to a flexible support, which allows the movement to take place. A more common arrangement on larger machines is to fit the base of the pedestal with sliding feet to allow free movement in the axial direction. Now let's take a close look at a typical rotor. Moving from the front end to the rear, we see first the thrust collar, which bears against the thrust pads during operation. Just ahead of this, there is the portion of the shaft which sits in the journal bearing. This area should be perfectly smooth with no indentations or marks. Moving further along, we come to the gland seals, which are needed to reduce steam leakage along the shaft. We'll be talking about this arrangement in more detail later. We now come to the series of wheels or discs as they are known, which extend along the length of the shaft. Blades are fitted all around the periphery of the discs and are held firmly in place at the roots. On many machines, further support is provided by fitting rings or shrouds around the outside of the blading. Note the much larger size of the low pressure blades in order to handle the increased volume of steam at this end. Now, continuing our examination along the length of the rotor, we come to the low pressure end gland seal. This is at the interface between the casing and the rotor. Just on the outside of the casing is fitted the low pressure end journal bearing. At the very end of the shaft, we find the coupling which is used to join the turbine and generator rotors. In addition, at this end of the shaft, we will often find a large gear drive which engages with the turning gear. As we'll see later, the turning gear allows us to rotate the rotor at very low speed, say one RPM, without having steam pass through the machine. This is used during shutdown to ensure even cooling and so prevent distortion of the rotor. More about this later. In earlier machines, the discs are shrunk onto the rotor shaft. A problem with this type of construction is that in some cases, steam may leak along the shaft and cause distortion due to differential heating as well as a loss of efficiency. To overcome this problem in modern turbines, the discs and the shaft are forged in one piece and then machined. Yet another method of building up the rotor is by welding discs together and so eliminating the shaft. Now remember that in between each disc and associated blades, we have to fit the stationary blades. Let's see how these are held in place. 
The first time we examine a turbine, we might imagine that these stationary blades could be fixed to the outer casing to line up with the moving blades like this. But we do have a problem with this arrangement. What is there to stop the steam passing around the blade instead of through it? In order to prevent this, a shield known as a diaphragm is constructed extending all the way from the inner diameter of the stationary blade down to the shaft, leaving a small clearance to allow rotation. In practice, the stationary blades are inserted into the diaphragm like this, and the diaphragm itself is fixed into the turbine casing. When diaphragms are removed during maintenance periods, they look like this. And here is a view of the bottom half of the turbine casing with the diaphragms in place. The diaphragms are sized to leave a small inside clearance to allow the shaft to rotate. Seal strips are fitted at this location to prevent steam leakage. After all, we want all steam to pass through the blading, not around it. And we'll be talking about steam seals later. When the turbine is assembled, the rotor must be very carefully lowered into plate. Okay. <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's about 30 minutes of this. So let's, uh, we can, uh, we may come back and watch the rest of this next time. I mean, the guy is good. It's amazing the depth of information that he provides. And there's a number of these out there. So, but I don't want to uh, overdo it here. So let me. Let me insert my microphone here and we'll get out of this. Okay, so what I want to do now is going back and we're working through our turbine article. <laughs> You'd probably rather have the video. I wouldn't blame you. But um, so we can we just do some of all of this. Okay. So let's see, I think, I think this is about where we are down here on seven. And okay, so I'm going to pick up down here at the bottom of seven. We'll, we'll do a number of, of pages here and look at some of these uh, figures and then uh, cap this up for today. Um, so this uh, term, uh, steam, main steam and reheat steam temperature droop. Um, that, this is a boiler characteristic that happens in the low load range. And that means that the boiler is not producing, you know, a whole lot of steam, okay? And, but it's, um, it's important for the plant to understand their boiler characteristics when it comes to doing starting, especially warmer hot starts, because based on the boiler characteristic, the boiler can only produce certain temperatures. And if the, if the rotors are very hot, then we'll have mismatch. And so if you hit a hot rotor with cold steam, you cool it down and then you get the thing moving. And as it moves, you're cooling it, cooling it. And all of a sudden you get up to high enough load and then the boiler can produce hot steam. And now you got a cool rotor and you turn around and heat it up again. <laughs> so this, uh, you know, that's exactly what you don't want to do. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this figure. What is it? Figure eight down here. Six. Okay, so this is his uh, boiler droop figure. It's our, you know, it takes a minute to look at this. So what do we have? We have steam temperature over here on the uh, Y axis and we have a percent load on the uh, X axis. And so you see over there, uh, over here on this side at 0% when you just, when that boiler just starts firing, start producing steam, uh, you can see the temperatures that we can get. So we've got the dash lines are superheat, so that's main steam. And then the uh, solid lines are reheat, okay? And so we've got two different curves. We've got one for a variable pressure operation of the boiler. 
and we haven't talked about that. So some boilers have the ability to do what they call sliding pressure, which means that um, the way you can control the turbine is you can just open the turbine control valves. And when you first start out, the boiler pressure is low. And so you don't get much steam flow. And as you come up in pressure, you get more and more steam flow. So you control the amount of steam flow through the turbine by controlling the pressure leaving the boiler. That's called sliding pressure operation. And those boilers, they've got special control valves built into them and all that sort of thing. I've never really seen a good diagram of a sliding pressure uh, control system on a boiler. But, and, and, and of course it depends on what boiler that you purchased. If you didn't buy sliding pressure capability on your boilers, then you don't have it. So this turbine article is talking about, you know, all, all possibilities that can be out there, but of course a given plant can only operate the equipment that they've got. Um, okay, so if we come up here on top, we can look at, this is our superheat temperature. And so if we have a variable or sliding pressure, we can start this off, we can get 900 degree steam. Well, if I've got a 900, 920, 950 degree rotor, that's pretty good matching, you know? If I don't, then I'm gonna be 850 or so. And so, you know, if you got a 950 or 920 degree rotor, that's a lot larger mismatch. And the steam is colder than the hot rotor. So you're gonna force cool it and then you're gonna heat it. So that's a much more damaging scenario than if I can give it the 900 and, and come up quickly and get the steam up at least close to the same temperature as the rotor and then bring them up together. Okay. And then you see the characteristics on the reheat. So this would be then for the intermediate pressure turbine. Uh, we're gonna start out and we're gonna be 850. And then you see as these two curves come up, the variable pressure, I can get up a higher temperature quicker. And I guess the other thing we didn't look at on the, the main steam is look at what temperature we reach a thousand. And a thousand is nominally your, your max, your, your, your main steam temperature at full load. So say with variable pressure, we can get there at 25% load. If I have fixed pressure, it's gonna be 50% load before I can get that high a temperature. And then we see on the uh, reheat, you can't peak out. And then this, this could be a little lower. It could actually be the same temperature and they just didn't wanna draw the curves on top of one another. But with variable pressure, uh, we can get the, uh, uh, the IP steam up at about 50%. And it looks like about 60, about halfway, about 62 and a half, 63% if you're fixed pressure. And then from that point on out, then you've got enough boiler load that you're out of this droop characteristic region on the boiler, okay? So that's what this temperature droop uh, is all about. And it's a boiler characteristic but it directly impacts the turbine. Let's see, so that was on the end of, uh, I think that was the end of seven. Yeah, okay, outside pressure. So we've on that. End of that first paragraph, we're finished. Um, and you know, he's talking here about, you know, many cases desired higher throttle temperature steam cannot be obtained until higher flows exist. Okay, so this is, this is pretty important statement here. To avoid forced cooling of an existing hot turbine with relatively cold steam, it may be prudent to move as quick as you can to roll as quickly as possible to rated speed, synchronize, which means what, tie to the grid, so that we're all, that we're actually producing power that leaves the station. 
and add higher than normal minimum load in order to produce higher temperature steam. Prolonged rolling at cold steam results in the forced cooling and then reheating. Okay. Um, in Europe, it's common to see these bypass systems. Let me go back down here. Here we go. And so here, what they can do is they can uh, produce steam and get steam production up in the boiler by basically bypassing the turbines and taking it to the condenser or finding a way to condense it in the system without taking it through the turbine. Now, efficiency wise, you know, you're throwing all this fuel in the boiler, coal or, you know, whatever, whatever fuel source you got, you're making all this steam and you're basically dumping it. Now you're not venting it, you're condensing it. So you're bypassing the turbines and say what we're doing is we're, you know, we've got all these different valves. So normally we'd come out, we'd go through our throttle control valves and all that sort of thing, come out here. Well, so your high pressure bypass valves and notice the superheating valves. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna spray liquid water. There's my boiler feed pump down here. So we're just gonna spray liquid water into this superheated steam to quench it, to start condensing it, whether you get all of it or not, you know, I don't know. Yes, it depends on the unit. And then, um, then you know, it's, it, it's got to go back to the reheater. So you're going to pick up steam there. And then uh, we've got these superheating valves down here on our condensate pump coming back in. And so you spray a bunch of water into it there and then you dump it in the condenser and hope the condenser can handle it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a high pressure intermediate pressure bypass system. Then the, the Europeans have built these into their units. The, you don't see many of these in the States. Um, and they're very hard to retrofit because it takes a bunch of pipe and you probably are gonna have an oversized condenser. Uh, if you, if you have a system like this put in. So there's a comment up above that it says, you know, it's, it's very difficult to retrofit. But anyway, if you have this, then you can fire the boiler. Maybe you get up to, you know, 30, 40, 50% uh, maximum steam production. And then the temperature comes up and then you throw the valves and go ahead and put it through the turbine and start making power. But you don't have to uh, thermally shock the rotors with low temperature steam. Kind of common sense stuff, you know, what you'd probably figure. Okay, so there's a discussion of that. Oh no, this thing. Little touchpad goes crazy sometimes. Okay. And so he mentions here uh, two shift cyclic operation. So that's where you would run a unit for four, five, six, seven, eight hours a day, and then you take it down for, for the rest of the day. Okay. And so that rotor is not going to have time to cool off much. Okay. Uh, so that lets us match temperatures pretty well. Okay, and then this, there, here's another thought down here at the bottom. So, I mean, these guys, they, they, they work this problem from one end and from the other. Um, one method of lessening temperature mismatch during hot restarts on older units is to lower the temperature of the turbine components during the previous shutdown sequence by maintaining full throttle pressure while using sequential governor valve mode of operation. So we haven't really gone through all of these valve programs, but sequential valve, that's where you might have six or eight valves that can emit steam around the 360 degree arc of the first stage. 
And so each valve contains or controls steam to a certain arc of admission. Well, sequential valve is the ability to open those valves one at a time or two at a time or you know, any sequence that the operator wants. And if you do that, then that results at low loads in the lowest steam temperature, okay? And so what they're saying here, it says, look, guy, if you can't match this on the high side when you come back in in the morning, let me cool it down tonight before I take it offline. And so you can go to a sequential governor valve mode of operation, come down, run it at really low load for a little while, and the steam temperature will be the coolest that you can produce. And so you will basically force cool the rotor, but you at least you'll bring it down slowly and under control. And you leave it at a temperature that you know in the morning when the guy comes in and fires up the boiler that he can match. So that's, you know, it's probably not the best, but, you know, it's a way to coordinate the operation so that you can facilitate temperature matching on the turbine the next morning or the next time, the next shift where they're gonna fire this thing up and the rotor's still gonna be hot. It, it's still gonna be in a heated state. It's not gonna cool down much because of the short period of time it's down. So we can basically force cool it a little bit here before we take it offline. That's what they're talking about here. So that's another possibility. So this is just kind of general stuff on load changes. Uh, every time you change load, you're gonna have changes in blade path steam temperature. And of course, we know thermal stresses developed in the rotor depend on the magnitude rate of change of load, which is rate of change of temperature. There's no one single rate of change that can be applied uniformly to all turbine operations if the idea is to limit stress, you know. But in general, small, small changes, you know, 10% load, something like that, you can just do it automatically. You're gonna go 50% load, 60% load change. You can't do it automatically. Too much of a temperature change. And so then you have to, you have to develop procedures for that. Uh, and I think we've kind of said this part before, greatest variation in steam temperature over the load range curves, first stage, first stage, HP rotor is most critical, critically stressed location. Uh, first stage steam temperature changes with both throttle temperature and load. That's because of boiler uh, characteristics. Uh, now temperature change also depended on the mode of governor valve operation. Okay, the various possible governor valve modes for load changing are sequential valve, which we just kind of talked about where I might have six or eight valves and I might say, okay, I'm gonna open one and two together when I first come up. Maybe as to kind of balance the, you know, put in steam on one side, put in steam on the other side. So you bring those up. When those are open, you say, okay, then we're gonna go three and four together. And then three and four open together. And then, so then you'd have, if you have eight, you'd have half your valves wide open, half your valves shut. You'd be at roughly 50% load. And then if you want to come on up at that point, it might be we're going to we're going to pop them one at a time. Open that valve until it's completely open. Then you got five valves open, et cetera. And you can move them up and down like that. And that that just uh, minimizes the throttling. Because when you, when you put steam through a partially closed valve, that's a loss of exergy. And that's the you lose some ability to do useful work. And so that's an efficiency degradation. So that the sequential valve is trying to avoid the throttling loss as much as possible. Okay, then two would be single valve or throttling mode, where you may have a variety of valves, but they all go to the same position at the same time. It's like you just have one, because they all operate in unison. So if you want 50% uh, flow, the valves, each valve goes to 50%. So you're throttling all of the steam. Well, that's gonna be a heat rate penalty or an efficiency penalty for, for doing that. Okay, and then sliding pressure mode, 
where a group of governor valves are fully open or maintained at a constant partially open position while inlet throttle pressure is changed. So um, you can do you could do sliding pressure with all of your valves open. So all the valves are wide open, minimum pressure to the boiler, bring up boiler pressure. You just bring it all the way up and get full boiler pressure, got full flow. You could say, okay, I'm gonna do sliding pressure with 50% of my valves open. So you open 50% of the valves, you leave 50% of the valves closed and you come up until you get full pressure. But at the point you're full pressure with 50% of valves open, you're at roughly 50% steam flow, you're at 50% load. If you want more power, then guess what? You're at full steam pressure, you just gotta start opening valves. So then your sequential valve after that. And, and so you could, you, could op, you could open 25% of your valves, slide pressure to 100% and then start opening valves from there. You could open 75% of your valves, slide pressure till you get maximum pressure and open the additional 25% as you need more. So that's, that, that's, what, that's how sliding pressure goes. So we really have quite a bit to talk about on these different valve programs. Uh, governor valves regulate steam flow into separate nozzle chambers, arranged circumferentially to admit steam generally in a 360 degree full arc to the first stage blading when all the valves are open. Thus each governor valve feeds steam to a portion or percent of the 360 degree arc. It's also called partial arc admission. Sequential valve is partial arc admission. Just different terms for the same thing. Uh, the size of the arc passing steam can be expressed as a percent of full arc admission. Uh, let's see, in the single valve mode, all the governor valves operate in unison, very flow by changing the amount of valve opening while feeding steam to the three to the hundred percent full arc of admission. So, with uh, single valve operation, you're feeding steam all the way around into that first stage. And then those valves just open and close in unison. Now, vibration wise, that's going to have a big impact because, say, if I'm partial arc, let's say I've got eight valves and I got five of them open or four of them open. So I'm at 50%. So I'm going to go through an arc of admission. And then I'm going to go through, if, if, if I'm one, think of yourself as a blade spinning around at 3,600 RPM. So you go through an arc that's active and you get bathed in steam. Oh man, it feels so good. And then you come to the next arc and that valve is shut. And it's like, oh crap, where'd it go? There's nothing. And so you're getting pounded, you're not getting pounded. You're getting pounded, you're not getting pounded. So if you got eight valves, four of them open, look at all the excitation for vibration as that thing goes around and around and around 3,600 times in a minute. Man, that's a lot of, that's a lot of pounding and not pounding, you know? I mean, count it up. Well, it's five times, well, it's four times 3,600. I ought to be able to do that in my head, but uh, you, you guys do that, man. What, what is that, 13,000, you know, pulses per minute? My God, can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine these things wear out, you know? And, and so that's, that's, I'm sure, a consideration. If you have if you have a turbine that has full valve program, so it goes back to what did you, what control system did you buy on your turbines? Do you have all of these different modes of, do you have a sliding pressure boiler? And do you have partial arc and uh, 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 capabilities built into your turbine? Or, oh no, now we just bought the, the throttling. Well, if that's all you got, that's what you're gonna use, you know, but you know, more sophisticated places, larger units will tend to have these capabilities. Okay. Uh, the effects of these different modes of going valve operation. Ah, my favorite figures. 10 and 11. Oh, this is, this is the best. It doesn't get any better than figures 10 and 11, trust me. 
He'll love them too, he assured me. Ah, oh, such a good thing. Ah, and I must tell you, I love these figures. When we have another test, you're likely to see these figures in some form or another or be tested on this information. Okay. So let's look at what we got here. Figure 10. So we've got first stage exit temperature. So that's the steam temperature exiting the first stage. Okay. And so we've got, uh, then we got throttle flow. So this is for a particular unit. And this thing goes up, looks like it goes up to about 6 million pounds an hour. That's a pretty good size unit. What, Kingston's, what, 200 megawatts? Well, this is six times two. This is, this is probably 1,000, maybe even 1,200 megawatts. This, this, this is pretty big. This is pretty big turbine. Okay. Um, and so you see we've got throttle flow, and it doesn't go to zero. We're showing... Uh, we're showing made just a little bit less than, uh, I guess, at one million pounds an hour is the minimum steam flow that you're seeing. Okay, well, I guess up at the top, we start at the top, says sliding pressure. Well, that's sliding pressure with all of your valves. That's 100% admission. And so you got all your valves open and you're just sliding pressure. Well, look at, I mean, look at the, the change in steam temperature. Well, it's almost nothing. What is it, 10, 10, 12 degrees over, I mean, the entire range that they plot it. Okay. Now, so if I've got sliding pressure capability and I come in in the morning and, and I look at my uh, first stage inner surface metal temperature and it's 930 degrees, I'm looking at this. But, hmm. I got sliding pressure control. I believe I'm gonna start this puppy, all valves open, sliding pressure. And I'm gonna give even hotter steam than the first stage has, the metal temperature, and, and I'm gonna bring it right back up. Man, that's, that's good. You'd like that. If on the other hand, the thing's been down for a week and you come in and that turbine metal temperature is 600, Oh, I don't think I want to do my sliding pressure start today. <laughs> I got a 600 degree metal temperature. Ew, that doesn't sound good. Yeah, engineering, if engineering catches me doing this, they will not be happy with me <laughs> at all. Okay. So if you had, let's say you had a 600 degree rotor, you'd probably go want to look at that bottom curve, right? Say that bottom curve is, um, Sequential valve, constant pressure. So that's where the boiler pressure is at its, you know, main operating point, and you start cracking valves. Now, it, it kind of looks on this one like they're running the first, the first fifty percent of the valves together, because they, they're they're really only showing. See, this is this this is fifty percent. There's sixty two and a half. There's seventy five, and there's a hundred. So, you know, now whether they're going to run those valves in, in different groupings like that or whether they're going to take one at a time and that sort of thing, it, just, it depends. It depends on how the equipment's put together and how they've decided to operate it. Um, these little dash lines in here, this is called a valve loop. And so the actual path, let's say, you know, say we come up on here, well, if we're taking all of these valves together, there would be a little dash line up here. That would be the actual point. This dark curve is just kind of like the smooth, drawing the smooth curve between this point, this point, this point, and this point. Because as I go from here to here, I actually bubble out on that valve loop. And that's that, as that valve um, starts to open, and continues to open until it gets fully open. So that's called a valve loop. But at any rate, you know, if I've got a 600, 650 degree rotor, uh, shoot, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do this uh, constant pressure sequential valve where I can give it as cold a steam as possible to not, not shock it any more than I have to. You know, and I mean, it's this, you know, I mean, these are kind of crude tools, but 
I mean, it's what they have to work with. Okay. So we've talked about the top line here, which is all valves open, slide pressure, max pressure, full load, all the valves are open, you're done, unless you want to start reducing pressure to reduce steam flow on that one. This is sequential valve, you know, and this, th there could be a series of valve loops in here. There could be like one, two, three, four, and then this is five, and this is actually six and seven. Is that right? No, this is uh, five, this is six, and this is seven and eight together, because it goes showing 75 to 100% ignition right there. But at any rate, but that's, so that's the partial arc or the uh, sliding pressure control line right here, as far as temperature is concerned, okay? Then you've got your constant pressure throttling control. So all of the valves operate like you just had one. You might have eight, but they all control. One's 50%, they're all 50%. One's 20%, they're all 20%. So you're throttling everything on the steam flow, okay? And then you've got these different, this is a hybrid, what they call a hybrid mode. So this is sliding pressure with 50% of the valves. So you get to that point, you're at full pressure. You got half the valves open, half the valve shut. You want more steam flow, you gotta start opening valves. You got nowhere else to go, okay? And so you start opening valves and then you just come up the sequential valve curve up to here, okay? Here's one with five of eight valves wide open. We slide pressure and then we get here, five valves open, three valves shut, start opening valves. Here's 75%. So if you got eight, what is that? That's six open two shut, slide pressure. So you get here, you're at max pressure, open valves, okay? Questions? All right. Well, let's see what the uh, efficiency implications of this are. Okay. Heat rate is what? One over efficiency. So this is, and this is not a total plant heat rate. This is, I guess, just tied up to the, around the turbine and the turbine inefficiency itself. Because that's too good a number for uh, overall plant efficiency. But anyway, uh, so you see that's BTUs of input energy to the boiler per kilowatt hour, okay. And that, like I said, I think there's other losses in the system that are not included in this calculation. This is a turbine, guys, heat rate. <clears throat> okay, uh, so I guess, well, what, okay, so, so the lower the number, the better the efficiency, right? If I wanna get a kilowatt hour, I don't wanna, I don't wanna use any more BTUs than I have to, right? Because BTUs cost money, because I got to burn something. I got to buy something. I got to burn it. Okay. So low heat rate, good heat rate. High heat rate, bad heat rate. <laughs> and if you want, I, I didn't bring my calculator. If you take that, if you take like that 8600 and divide it by 3413 and take one over it, it'll give you the the fractional, and then multiply that by 100 if you want a percent that'll give you the percent that comes from that. Because there's what, 3413 what, BTUs in a kilowatt hour. So that basically makes it dimensionless and then you gotta take one over it. Okay, well, so what's the worst one is the highest heat rate. Guess what? Throttling control, just what you would thought. You know, because throttling represents what? Exergy destruction. Exergy is the opportunity to do useful work. We're destroying that opportunity and it hurts the efficiency. Absolutely. So there's throttling pressure up on top. The next one down, next worst one is just sliding pressure 
all by itself with all the valves open. Okay, so it comes down. And then, uh, let's see, you gotta be, boy, these things will, I always have to look at this one before I come in here, I'll screw it up. Um, got lots of curves on here. Okay, this guy right here, that's solid here, it comes down. This is the um, sequential valve curve. And so this is the sequential valve and it's coming out. So there, he, he shows these first 50% uh, of the valves together. But at any rate, so this is sequential valve, which is full boiler pressure, opening those valves together. And he doesn't, he doesn't show any valve loops on that first part. But so then we get 50% admission is right here for those valves open. And then when we pop another valve, he shows the valve loop from 50 to 62 and a half and another valve loop. Oh, he shows, he shows all the additional valve loops here from 62 and a half to 75, from 75 to 87 and a half, and then 87 and a half to 100%. So, that uh, solid line there is just, it shows with, with all of the valves open, no partials for the sequential valve control. And it comes up to here. And then it's that solid line that's coming up right there. Right here, okay? Okay, now the bottom curve this is 50% admission with sliding pressure. So see right here, we've got half our valves open, half our valves shut, and we slide pressure until we get to this point, and then we start popping valves, okay? This is 62 and a half percent admission, sliding pressure. So that's five valves open, slide down this line until we get to this point at full boiler pressure, start popping valves. 75% emission, sliding down this line until we come in down here at this point, pop two more valves. He, got, he didn't draw a line for 87 and a half percent. Okay. So, I mean, what do you think? So what's the overall, if you're just looking at efficiency, What's your favorite curve? What, what's the best curve on there? Right, lowest heat rate. Lowest heat rate, highest efficiency. Looks to me like it's 50% admission, sliding pressure to you get all those open and then start popping valves. That's the best you got. And that's what he calls hybrid operation, which brings us to Ta da Hybrid operation. And so he's, he kind of hashed that one in. And efficiency wise, that's, that's, the one, that's the one we like, if you have that capability. Now, this is showing the uh, temperature aspects of it, right? And so, is it the best for temperature? Well, I mean, I don't know. Let me go look and see what, you know, if you're about to do a startup, let me go look and see what temperature the rotor is. <laughs> and I'll tell you when I get back, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you a call, you know, and let you know. I mean, if you, got a, if you got a 930 degree rotor, no, not really. But uh, it, from an efficiency point of view, it's pretty good. So, you know, you, you, these things have to, these competing interests have to be uh, balanced with uh, policies by the uh, engineering staff and plant manager. And believe me, um, in, in some of these plants, there's oftentimes not complete agreement and harmony between the operations personnel and the engineering personnel is the engineering personnel will come in and they'll observe some of this and they'll go, crap. They go back to the office and say, do you see what he's doing down there? Man, he's gonna wreck that daggum rotor. 
you know, he slammed, he slammed 940 degree steam on a 600 degree rotor and he didn't have to do that. What did he do that for? Oh, maybe he wasn't paying attention. <laughs> maybe he doesn't care. <laughs> maybe his boss is not the same, doesn't answer directly to the engineering boss. So you got maintenance, you got maintenance, you got operation, and you got engineering in these plants. And you know, they all have their own managers. And all those managers answer to the plant manager. It depends on the plant manager as to who cooperates with who and uh, at what level. And so they have lots of interesting discussions. Engineering will come in and say, hey, those guys are gonna wreck this thing. And the uh, operation manager said, hey, look, we do that. We do that because this valve sticks. All right, we've got a maintenance issue. And then they all turn around and look at maintenance and they say, well, like it's on back order, you know, and, and around and around it goes. So it's up to the plant manager. If there's not a good reason and they keep doing it and the plant manager won't say anything about it, they'll probably keep doing it because the engineering guys can walk in the control room and, and try to tell the uh, operations guys, hey, we don't want you doing that. And they will have some very colorful language for them and ask them to leave their control room, you know? And the engineers cannot directly order operations to change procedures unless the plant manager says, yes, you will do that, in which case then they have to do it. I've sat in on one or two of these meetings and it's, uh, and not always, but the topics will come up and there will be disagreement. And sometimes it's pretty heated. You know, people will get passionate and say, no, we can't do that. We tried that back in the day and this is what happened. And the engineer go, there's no reason for that to happen. That was some other problem. Well, it happened. And the managers go, okay, okay. Everybody calm down, everybody calm down. We got to work together here. And he's sitting there thinking, yeah, I need two more weeks and I get my bonus check, you know? <laughs> I don't want this thing to blow up in my face now. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. But uh, anyway, okay. I think that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, pretty good class for today. We'll come back and we're just about uh, to finish this. And then uh, I've got another video or two I want you to watch. So we're, in, I don't know, 10 days, two weeks, we're probably looking for, looking for another test, something like that on everything since Thermo. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it'll be on iLearn. Yeah. yeah. It'll be on iLearn and it'll be probably lots of multiple choices. And I don't know, I could even, I could even make up a, you know, I could let you pull some heat rate numbers or something to do some efficiency calculations or something. But most of it, you know, is informational type stuff on the, on the boilers and the turbine stuff. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a few out of these videos that I, I hope that we watch. Because that boy, that boy on those videos, he's good. He is really good. He knows his power plant stuff. Okay, everybody have a great day. And uh, I'll get this posted. At least I remembered to record it this time. See you guys soon.